Whenever anyone mentions the name of Mickey Mantle, I always say, why couldn't I hit like that fella? Here is a young ball player with the New York Yankees that possesses more natural potential ability than any young player that I can recall coming into Major League Baseball. Oh, uh, several years ago, there was a young player by the name of Pete Reese who joined the Brooklyn Dodgers that had pretty much the same sort of ability as a youngster that Mantle had, but I think Mickey stands out above all of the young players that have come into the major leagues. If I can go out on the field uh, and talk to Mickey, I think uh, he might be able to tell us how he became such a natural switch hitter. Say, uh, Mickey, Mickey Mantle, I'd like to have you come over here and talk a little baseball. How are you? Say, uh, in your career, Mickey, you made a rather rapid rise in baseball coming up from the low classification in the minors right up to the major leagues. How did that feel? Well, it felt pretty good, Lou. Uh, I think that uh, from uh, Class C up to uh, the AAA is not too much of a jump, but I think from uh, AAA into the majors is the big difference. Well, of course, you're entitled to your own opinion, Mickey, but I think that the ability of a certain Mickey Mantle had a lot to do with that. You know, your present manager, good old Casey Stengel, whom I've played against for a long time in the National League, had a lot of confidence with you uh, right from the start. You know that. Let's hear a few words about that. Well, I don't, uh, I don't know anything about that, Lou. I think that uh, Casey's given me an awful good break so far in letting me stay up here as long as he did. Well, you know what he told me only yesterday? That you've given him a pretty good break, too, the way you can wallop that baseball and run around the base paths and feel that ball in center field. I'd like to ask you this uh, rather pointed question, Mickey. Uh, as I get the story, your, your dad was the one that was primarily responsible for you becoming a switch hitter. Is that right? That's right, Lou. I guess I was about uh, six years old when he started me doing that. He would... Uh, come home from work and he would pitch uh, right-handed to me and my grandfather would uh, pitch left-handed to me. You had some valuable experience as a youngster in that respect. Uh, I don't know whether you know it or not, Mickey, but for more than 30 years I've watched some pretty good batters in Major League Baseball, switch hitters and all, and the part that amazes me concerning yourself at the plate is the tremendous power that you have both as a left-handed hitter and a right-handed hitter. How do you account for that? Well, I guess it's just uh, a natural feeling I have both ways because I've batted that way so long, I guess, Lou. Well, I think some of these other major league hitters wish that they had that so-called natural feeling at the plate. Uh, now about center field play, Mickey. You are the Yankee center fielder now, and you were asked to fill the shoes of one of the great, great stars of the game, Joe DiMaggio. How about Joe? You watched him play, and you played with him. Well, I don't think that there'll ever be anybody that could fill his shoes. Uh, I know that I'd, I'm really happy that I get the chance to try. That's all I can say. Uh, Mickey, during the 1952 season, uh, the records show that you had 23 home runs. I believe that uh, 12 of them you hit left-handed, and 11 of those round-trip wallops were from the right side of the plate. That's a pretty good even level. Well, uh, I hope it should stay that even all the time, Luke. Well, if you keep swinging the way you have been up at the plate, I believe it will. Uh, how come a long-distance hitter like you, Mickey, goes in for a drag bunt as well as those long-distance wallops? Well, a lot of times I don't get them long-distance wallops, Lou, and uh, I've been practicing the drag bunt ever since I started playing baseball. That's another one of my dad's ideas. So I never really got it down real good till I got up here, and uh, Casey Stingle uh, showed me how that he used to drag and since, uh, since that time, I've uh, picked up quite a few percentage points during the season like that. Especially when I'm striking out a lot, you know, why I can uh, <laughs> start dragging. Well, I remember in two particular instances, Mickey, in World Series play, where that drag bunt worked out to perfection. Uh, one other thing now. Uh, we know that you're just about the fastest man going down to first base uh, on the left side of the plate uh, in three and one-tenth seconds. Do you have any particular way of getting a start? No, I imagine that when they clocked out, it was on a drag bunt, though, because uh, just as soon as the pitcher throws the ball, well, I start running, you know, and uh, you, that way you get a couple of steps or three ahead of them. Well, when you start running, you start flying. I think that's about the best answer I can give to that one, Mickey. I'd like to go into some World Series data now with you. How many World Series have you played in? 
Well, I played in two, uh, but in 51, I didn't get to play but one game, and in the second game, I injured my right knee, Lou. That uh, took you out of the World Series play for the balance of the games? That's right. Well, let's get into the 1952 series, then. I know you had uh, quite a time for it up there at the plate, uh, much to the discomfort of some of those Dodger pitchers who were trying to get you out. Do you recall any one particular ball game or play that uh, stands out in your mind of the 1952 series? Well, I think that uh, the game that stands out with me is the one that I did the best in probably would be the, the last game, the seventh game of the World Series, Lou. Well, I recall, I think, every play, Mickey, of that seventh World Series game. The Yankees returned to Ebbets Field, where they had tired the series the day before and sent it into the final game. The Dodgers still were a game away from their first championship. Honey Mack is on hand. Commissioner Ford Frick talks to Bill Dickey, while Dodger manager Chuck Dressen is anxious to get going. Eddie Lopat warms up for his second start. Rookie sensation Joe Black walks toward the mound and the game is on. It's scoreless until Rosuto faces Black in the fourth. Scooter doubles to the left field corner and moves to third as Mantle grounds out to Hodges. Reliable Johnny Mize then lines a single to left field to score Rizzuto. The Yankees take a one to nothing lead in the payoff battle. In the dodge of fourth, Duke Snyder rifles a single to right. Jackie Robinson comes up. Beats out a bunt to Lopat. Snyder taking second. After Campanella drops another safe bunt in the same spot, Stengel comes out and removes Lopat. In comes Allie Reynolds for his fourth appearance in the series. Hodges smashes the liner right at Woodling, and Snyder scores after the catch. The game is tied at one and one. Ties it with a fifth inning homer over the screen and right. The Dodgers fifth, one man out. Billy Cox doubles to the right center field wall. Reese follows with a line sing of the left, scoring Cox, and there's another tie score, two and two. Sixth inning, one away. It's the young Yankee star, Mickey Mantle, at the plate. He swings and pops a home run over the right field wall into Bedford Avenue to send the Yanks into a 3-2 lead in the seesaw battle for the championship of the world. Mize follows with a base hit to right. And manager Charlie Dressen replaces Black with his cagey left-hander, Preacher Rowe. After the bases were loaded, Martin flies to Snyder to end the Yankees' sixth, and Rowe has saved his team from further trouble in this inning. In the Yanks' seventh, McDougald is on second with two outs. It's Mantle batting right-handed this time. And again he hits. A single to left, scoring McDougal with an all-important insurance run. The score is 4-2 Yanks. Manager Stengel sends Vic Rashi into pitch in the Dodgers' seventh. Furilla walks. And with one out, Cox singles to right. And Reese walks to fill the bases. And that was all for Rashi. Lefty Bob Kazava replaces him. He was called in in a similar clutch in the last game of the 1951 series. Snyder working Kazava to a 3-2 count, pops to McDougal. 
for an automatic out. The two out the base are loaded. Robinson swings and hits a windblown fly to the infield. Billy Martin races in four and catches on the dead run for one of the most sensational plays of the entire series. Let's have another look at this all-important play in its complete action. This ends the inning for the Dodgers with the score still 4-2 Yanks. Carl Erskine pitched the eighth and ninth innings against the Yanks, allowing one hit and no runs. The Dodgers ninth. Bobby Morgan has set up the bat for Erskine and flies to Woodling. Martin throws out Cox and is two away. flies to Woodling and the Yanks are the world's champs. Four games to three. Yogi Berra goes wild and leaps on Kazaba's back. The game-saving Yankee left-hander takes a beating from his happy teammates. And the Yankees go off the field with another dramatic World Series victory. Well, Mickey, uh, how'd you like that ball game? Well, the Yankees won that game, uh, Lou, and you know we got a little more money for it by winning it. And it was a great experience. I was really uh, glad that we won it and everything. Well, I think you'll be in some more of those series before you take that suit off for good. I'd just like to tell you, Mickey, that I've enjoyed our little baseball talk and hope you keep on and have some great years in baseball here with the New York Yankees. There's the story from a great young ball player, Mickey Mantle. Well, that's all for now. See you again on TV's Baseball Hall of Fame.